last weekend was an exciting weekend on campus here at IPFW, especially in the Hilliard Gate Sports Center as the IPFW Volleygons began their volleyball season with two exciting matches. On this week's edition of Mastodon Spotlight, we're going to talk with my partner in crime on College 56, Ryan Parat. We'll look back at those matches, look ahead to some future matches, talk a little women's basketball as well, and then later in the program we'll continue our discussion of women's basketball as we talk with uh, head coach Bruce Patterson. Our show is called Mastodon Spotlight, and it's coming up next. Hi again, everybody. I'm Mike Miles. Welcome once again to Mastodon Spotlight. Well, as I said a moment ago, the volleyball season for men began with a bang last weekend here at the Hilliard Gate Sports Center. Two exciting matches. Both went the limit, five games each, uh, against nationally ranked Long Beach State on Friday night and against uh, a young and upcoming nemesis of IPFW's Concordia College of Bronxville, New York, on Saturday night. We here at College 56 Sports had the chance to broadcast those matches live and my first guest this week is my partner in crime so to speak for men's volleyball and women's basketball here at College 56 Ryan Parat. Thanks Mike nice to be here. Um, two exciting matches to say the least looking back uh, your thoughts and we'll talk first about the Long Beach State match which we as we found out after the fact was played in front of the fourth largest crowd ever to see a volleyball match here in the Hilliard Gate Sports Center. Over 2,200 fans. It was an unbelievable atmosphere Friday night uh, with the sixth strength 49ers of Long Beach State. And we came out with such intensity and such energy. And part of that was because of the crowd. Most of it probably because of the crowd. Uh, and we were able to take the first two sets from Long Beach State. And then we came, kind of got into a lull in the third game. We let that one slip away. The fourth game I thought we had, the one that we lost 32-30. I thought we had that. A uh, couple key plays here and there down the stretch of that game. A um, couple questionable calls, a couple questionable decisions on IPFW players' part. Um, and then, of course, the exciting fifth game, 16-14. It was kind of a heartbreaker to see. Uh, and, of course, I know firsthand the experience of losing five sets to Long Beach State. Uh, perhaps in a more dramatic way at the Final Four in 1999 at Poly Pavilion. But um, a great showing by IPFW, I thought. Uh, you got to understand, this is the first match of the season uh, for two of the players, at least two of the freshmen, Mitch Dreisbach and Dennis Santiago, the setter. Uh, this is their first NCAA volleyball matches of the career. So, um, you know, positive, you can take positives out of it, and uh, they should have nothing to be ashamed about their performance Friday night. One of the reasons that I enjoy working with you for both basketball and especially volleyball, um, again, some of our viewers may not realize you played four years of volleyball here at IPFW, mm -hmm. and your knowledge and expertise saves me <laughs> on more occasions than I care to count. <laughs> but I thought it was apropos. I remember we talked in between games two and three Friday night. Mm -hmm. We had won the first two games. Came back. We were down 18-11 in game one. Yeah. Came back and won that game. Uh, I believe that was the 30-27 game, and then we won 30-24, to or vice versa. But we were up two. And I remember asking you, okay, what does Long Beach State have to do to get back into this match? And the very first thing you said was, they have to serve better. Yes. And lo and behold, you were the prophet, <laughs> because they came back in game three, served well, and won 30-23 to convincingly. Um, looking back now, after that game three, Long Beach wins. We knew game four was, was going to be a tough right. one. Um, 30, it's just at 32-30, we had several chances 
to win it outright. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, it's just the little plays, the little key. And volleyball, just like any other sport, and I've been fortunate enough, I was able to play under head coach Ernie Ball's system here for four years. It's about adjustments. And Long Beach State made the adjustment in game three because I believe after two games, they had one service ace to 12 or 13 service errors. Obviously a terrible ratio. And so when you start putting the ball into the court, you have a chance to get points. And especially now with the Raleigh scoring system, point per play, you got to put the ball in the court. And that's what they started doing. They slowly got momentum. We didn't uh, particularly receive serve well in game three. And then they started running the middle. And their middles had a great hitting percentage against IPF. I believe both of them were over at least 70%, I believe. Um, and then slowly they were getting momentum. And then the fourth game was a seesaw heavyweight battle, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and I said we ended up, I believe we did have a couple, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, chances to to at least get to game and match points in the fourth game. I can think of three match yeah. points that we had in the course yes. of that fourth game, and uh, and it also again perception, knowledge, uh, as you say, knowledge of the coach's system. I remember I asked you, um, Angel Ruiz had a tremendous weekend, uh, perhaps the best he's ever played here, mm -hmm. and he had 25 kills in that match with Long Beach. But yet I remember asking you, and I don't remember if it was on air or off air during a break, well, we get to match point, does Dennis Santiago set up Angel? Or do we go back to the leader of this team, Jeff Patak? Right. And you said, look for Jeff. And sure enough, there was one play where Dennis set Jeff up, and he hit a great shot. How Long Beach got it back, I'll never know. But uh, we day. had the chances. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing. Now, Dennis Santiago, I thought, distributed the volleyball nicely all weekend long. And Angel Ruiz, as I said on the Concordia telecast, he had an All-American weekend. This is the best volleyball back-to-back -back matches I've ever seen him play. 25 kills against uh, Long Beach State, 28 against Concordia. Hit, what, 50% against the 49ers, 57% against the Clippers. Um, he was phenomenal. And down the stretch... You know, whether it's a freshman set or what have you, do you continue to set your hot player or do you go to the person who has gotten you there over the years? And Jeff Petak. And it was a great dig on the port of the 49ers to keep the rally going and so oh, forth yeah. and going up to win the battle. But as I said, I mean, that's, that's sort of the learning process. This is the first match of the season, and that's what people have to understand, that this was the first match. Yes, it was the best, the sixth-ranked team in the country, great California school, great rivalry, great tradition. Uh, but this is the first match of the season, and they should be able to take positives out of their performance. You had a chance to play with a setter by the name of Chris Gisler. Mm -hmm. You had a chance to see Dennis Santiago for two matches. Mm -hmm. Can you compare and contrast the two? I know it's hard. It's hard. Only two matches. Yeah. But, uh, and as we said on the telecast Saturday night, no offense to Ryan Staley, who did an admirable mm -hmm. job last year coming in and, and being the setter. Yeah. But as I told Arnie, um, I was impressed with a setter getting a number of kills. Mm -hmm. And he moved the ball around, and uh, I thought he did a, you know, for his first two collegiate matches, did extremely well. But Chris Gislin was also one of the best setters. Uh, we all know who the best setter <laughs> that's ever played IPFW men's volleyball is. Yeah. But um, compare and contrast if you can. Absolutely. Well, with Dennis Santiago coming in, and he has the advantage because he's left-handed, and we haven't had that over the course of, at least that I know anyway, for with Loy Ball, Scott Lauer, Ryan Staley, Chris Gislin setting. Uh, Dennis is the first left-handed setter here in a while, I would assume. Uh, and so he's so aggressive with that. He gets himself into the offense when he's in the front row. He becomes an attacker in the front row. It gives him that extra advantage of being left-handed. And he's so fast. I was watching videotape yesterday in practice. He's just so fast. He's getting to balls that other players should be getting. But he just runs across the court. He's so, so quick. He's like a cheetah. He just gets up, picks up the ball. It's, it's phenomenal that way. Um, of course, with Chris Gislin, he was a bigger setter. He was so tall. He was 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, uh, had great hands, was a tremendous blocker at that size. We were able to move him not only block on the right side, but he would also block middle and have a couple of stuff blocks per match there. Uh, and, of course, his serving was on, off the charts. I mean, this guy would hit the ball as hard as anybody I've ever seen play. Um, so, yes, Dennis is young, and he's got a long way to develop still as he gets his mental game into who's on the offense, 
Angel Ruiz is on fire? Should I continue to set him? Starting to get, I think one thing that Dennis is going to have to start to do is get the other middle, Josh Sanders, involved. Angel now not only hitting out of the front row middle, but also now he's moving him uh, around in the back row, either the pipe or the right side backcourt. I think he's got to get Josh Sanders involved a little bit more as well. And then, you know, we'll see what happens. But I thought his set distribution was great all weekend. Um, I'd like to see him perhaps get rid of that jump floater and go with the topspin. I've been able to practice with him. He's got a really nice topspin serve. I'd like to see him do that. Um, and work, continue to work on his blocking game. And uh, you know what? This team could go a long way behind their setter. With the good comes some bad. Mm -hmm. And probably the worst thing that we saw Friday night was in point number 11 of game five. When, uh, as it turns out now, uh, we lost Matty Bashevsky who retore the anterior crucial ligament. I didn't think I'd be get the chance to pronounce that right. Yeah. But he tore his ACL again, which he had just done. Um, and I forget, he and Jeff had the knee injuries, one in September, one in October. They both had surgery. Mm -hmm. They both played tremendously Friday night. He just hits the winning kill, puts us up 6-5, but blows the knee out again. Um, you being a former player, and we were right in front of the action, what were your thoughts when he went down? Disheartening. To work so hard to get back to a level of trying to compete again at the Division One level. And to see that happen, especially in the fifth game. You've come all this way and in the fifth game. And I had made uh, a mistake on there because I had said that perhaps I thought he might have landed on a Long Beach State blocker's foot and then had twisted it. Well, after seeing the replay of it on tape, uh, what happened was he contorted his body one way to deceive with the cut shot, and when he landed, he put all the pressure on his left knee, the bad damaged knee, and he had twisted it, and then he had torn his ACL again. Uh, but it was disheartening to see that um, occur to, to Matty, who has worked so hard in one season um, to come back and to get himself in the, to playing shape and become more aggressive as a volleyball player. Um, and he was leading, by the way, in digs at the time of his injury. And he did, as you mentioned, he did get the point to go to 6-5, but he was leading the team in digs as well, was hitting decently. Um, and just to see that happen in the fifth set was, uh, was uh, such a big blow, I think, to IPFW, the volleyball team, um, and of course to all the 2,210 fans that were there to see it. Well, it was disheartening to see, and for everyone's information, uh, Maddie is going to be having surgery within the next couple of weeks, and uh, he will be gone for the rest of the year. Uh, hopefully, um, they're going to be able to get a medical redshirt year out of him. So, all is not lost, and we hope that uh, the surgery will be successful when he comes back next year. But yeah. And hopefully, um, Jeff as well can stay out because uh, latest reports have him because of his knee. He had his, uh, I believe, his meniscus was torn underneath the kneecap, and they did surgical repair in the fall to do that, and now it's back to being uh, critical, uh, a critical stage, really damaged. and. Uh, he did not play against Concordia on Saturday night, and we'll see if he is able to play at all for the remainder of the season as well, because his knee and, uh, is just, it's just killing him, just killing him. So we'll see. Our first guest is Ryan Parrott, my partner in crime on College 56 broadcast. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll continue talking volleyball and also talk women's basketball, as we've got a big game this coming uh, Saturday that will be shown on College 56 as well. So please stay tuned. Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. For over three decades, Dr. James Owen has been credited for helping IPFW become a top-rated school through not only teaching, but also his involvement in the Fort Wayne community. The kind of people that the city were hiring at the time were people with advanced computer skills. I thought, my lord, unless my students get up to speed in this particular area, uh, skill and talent, knowledge, uh, that they weren't going to be competitive in the job market. Dr. Owen developed courses that would train his students to become leaders in the community. At one time, of the six major department heads in the city of Fort Wayne, uh, three of them were former students of mine that I'd recommended for the job. He makes a point to stay in touch with former students, and that makes a difference in their lives. Uh, whenever I think about undergraduate days, I always think about old professor so-and-so. She said, I have one like that, too. And she said that that's Dr. Owen. IPFW, the right school, right here, right now.
came from every corner of the country. From small towns and big cities. But they all shared one thing in common. They belonged to a family called Marines. A tough and determined few dedicated to protecting everything we hold sacred. And still they come. Celebrate the 225 year history of those proud few who have earned the title Marine. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. Our first guest this week is my broadcast partner for uh, men's volleyball and women's basketball here in College 56 Sports, Ryan Peratt. And Ryan, we were just talking about the injury to Matty Bashevsky mm -hmm. Friday night. And uh, you talk about Jeff Patak and his possibility, um, and Coach Ball will probably allude to it on his show, that um, Jeff may possibly get a medical red shirt this year mm -hmm. and hopefully build the knee up and come back next year as well because he still has, uh, if it's approved, one year of eligibility left. If that does happen, that scenario takes place, we lose two important cogs this year, but let's look ahead. Uh, this is still a team that played well. Uh, they split their matches. They lost Friday night. They beat Concordia College Saturday night. They're one and one. And uh, again, we talked with Angel Ruiz but, and Dennis Santiago, but there are some other players uh, who had some good performances as well. Where can this team go even if we do lose both Maddie and Jeff? And the only way to go is up. I think this is a great opportunity for a lot of players on the IPFW men's volleyball team now to step up. Uh, players like Josh Sanders, players like Ara Sarah Ryan Staley, I think all these players, even Matt McCarter, Mitch Dreisbach, I believe these are great opportunities for these guys now to step in and say, hey, look, we have two of our outstanding players injured, potentially for the rest of the season, and Matty for the rest of the season, Jeff, still questionable. This is my time now to contribute to the team. And after watching the first two games on Saturday, you'd think, highly different after they stunk up the place, uh, losing the first two games to Concordia before rallying to win in five. Um, but somehow this team needs to rally behind leadership. And that's been the big question, I guess, over the last couple of years is the leadership factor of this, this program and this team. Can people, can someone on the court get the troops together? Uh, whether it's times of good or times of bad, like we saw earlier, the first two games against Concordia, to say, hey, look, we, let's pull ourselves together, let's get composed, let's get focused again. And right now it seems that Angel Ruiz and Dennis Santiago are the two most viable people for that position or those roles. Um, but I believe that Ara Sarah Ryan Staley, Mitch Dreisbach, all these players can step up and perform at the Division One level. Well, this coming weekend they're going up into your neck of the woods, actually a little further north, <laughs> you being a northeast. Windsor. On they're going northeast. northeast. They're going you're, you're a native of Windsor, Ontario. And they're going up into Nova Scotia, yeah. and they're going to play what's termed some exhibition matches. But uh, it's definitely an opportunity for some of these younger players, as you say. Dennis Santiago has only been with us for two matches, mm -hmm. um, and some of the other people to get some experience. Um, so it'd be a good opportunity for them there. And then they come back in two weeks, and our next volleyball telecast is going to be on the 26th against the University of Findlay mm -hmm. as we get into MEVA action. Uh, quick thought on the MIVA, and then we're going to switch sports. Okay, MIVA's tough. I think this, this upcoming weekend when they go out to Dalhousie uh, in Nova Scotia, I think this is a perfect time to see these other players perform. They're playing three top Canadian teams. It'll be good competition. Rules are perhaps a little bit different, but uh, I think these, this is a good opportunity for other players to step in. Coach will be able to evaluate these players in their particular um, situations and, and different playing scenarios, if you will, with Jeff and Maddie um, injured. Um, the MIVA is tough this year. I believe they ranked, we had the preseason rankings, I believe they picked IPFW to finish sixth. Um, Lewis, I believe, to finish first, if I'm not mistaken, Ball State second. Um, Ball State looks impressive. They beat Long Beach State Saturday night in four. Um, 
it's it's up for grabs. There's no one team that stands out anymore like in years past where you had dominant teams, Ball State, Ohio State, IPFW. Um, so I believe that if IPFW can get off to a good start against Finley, play well against Finley, execute well, come out with that intensity and energy like they had against Long Beach State the first two games, play well, make it convincing. If they believe in that, I believe that can, they can start getting some momentum and steamroll. Um, uh, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, absolutely, uh, and they're going to have to prepare for it really well. Well, let's shift gears now. As I said, you're my partner in crime, not only in men's <laughs> volleyball, but in women's basketball. And we're going to have Coach Bruce Patterson on a little bit later, possibly one of the players as well. Trying times for the women's basketball team in more ways than one. Um, they've stepped up from Division II level, where they were 19 and 8 a year ago, mm -hmm. to Division I competition almost exclusively. Uh, I think as we're taping this show, I want to say they're either 4-13 and 13 or 4-14. and 14. Um, They've lost some players. They lost Kathy Hay and Vera Bibbs to academics. They lost Lindsay Wurtz to an injury. I know Laura Douglas was injured, and I haven't had a chance. There's a possibility that she may be gone, possibly to a broken wrist, and Bruce will confirm that for us mm -hmm. when he comes on a little bit later. Uh, in fact, they've had to get one of the women's volleyball players, Chrissy Miller, who admittedly hasn't played basketball in six years, uh, but then she, she graciously came out, if not for moral support, another body. Trying times. Your thoughts on, on what's going on with the women's team? Decimated by injuries and, uh, of course, um, losing a couple players to academics uh, doesn't help as well. Um, it's very promising, I believe, for uh, the IPFW women's basketball program, um, especially in these times anyway. It's very promising that they are young. It's our first year of Division I competition. We're slowly getting to know the ropes, if you will. Uh, and they've played well. Most of the matches, they have played well under Division I you know, standard of play now. Um, but it does hurt. Personnel does hurt now, becoming more limited, asking various players from different teams now to come in, Christy Miller perhaps, to come in from the women's volleyball team. Um, again, they're going to need leadership now on this team. Somebody's going to have to step up um, and sort of help the team along in its course. Now, are we going to win every single game? Who knows? But to be competitive, I think, is one thing that the coaching staff is looking for, to play a full 40 minutes of basketball. Um, and to sort of get some sync um, togetherness, some unity um, with this team, especially with the new year now after the injuries and the academic losses. So, um, you know, this team is going to have to rally somehow, find some inner, inner strength to rally uh, with one another. Put yourself in the coach's shoes. I'm going to put you on the hot <laughs> spot. Why not? Um, uh, and one of the things that Chris Paul mentioned to me about 10 days ago, the effort is there, mm -hmm. seems to be there from everyone. It's just one of those unfortunate situations. Basketball is a 40-minute game. It seems like after 30 minutes, as he put it, Chris put it, we hit the wall simply because we just have a handful of bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes if, its if, toll. If you, could, if you could whip up a crystal ball... <laughs> short of getting a couple of players eligible, which isn't going to happen. Right. Um, there's still a number of games to be played, including this Saturday, um, a game where you're going to play hooky, but for medical reasons, we'll forgive you. They're <laughs> um, going to take on the University of Toledo yeah. at 3.30 that we're going to broadcast here on uh, College 56 Sports. If, if you could whip up a concoction that um, not just would translate into a couple of more Ws, but make things better overall, what might it be? Well, obviously, I don't have the coaching expertise like Coach Patterson does. And he was successful for years over at St. Francis, and uh, he will be successful here at IPFW. Uh, he will have to use his personnel. He's going to have to find a way to use his personnel, both at a maximum level and also a restraining level, to say, hey, look, we have to save some energy for you because we have to play 40 minutes and we only have a certain amount of bodies to play with. Um, does he start going to the zone defense, perhaps, to rest? Maybe. Does he press full court for a while? Possibly. 
You know, there are so many variations, and of course, he would know better than anybody. But if it was me personally, because you're putting me on the spot, if it was me personally, uh, I would take how many? The eight, the ten players that I have, and I say, look, this is all we have. This is our team. This is it for the rest of the year. Now until uh, March, April. This is it right here. So we either put in all the chips together, trying to use a Jim Fossil line, put it all in the middle of the table, and let's go all out. Let's go out. Let's see where the chips fall. We're going to play hard for 40 minutes. We're going to try to execute for 40 minutes. We're going to try to do the things that we've worked on throughout the course of the year to become successful. Rebounding, transition, free throw shooting, perimeter shooting, all that stuff. We're going to work on that. And I believe if they can get into the high tempo and probably get in even better shape, better conditioning, high tempo, press, zone, trap, all over the place, I think they can be successful. I really do. But of course, I'm not the coach, thank goodness. And Coach Patterson will be able to uh, maximize his players efficiently, I believe. We've got a couple of minutes left in this segment. Um, I'll throw another curveball at you. <laughs> we are in the final transitional year to actually being a fully Division I university. Mm -hmm. Now that you've had some time to think about it, what are your thoughts on the move? Are we going to be successful? Uh, was it good? Was it bad? You had asked me that, I think, previously. Yeah, and well, I'm going to ask I, you again. Oh, as I, more time to absolutely. Well, as I said, I think that the funk now of going Division One by the players, the coaching staff, what have you, because of the transition, it had just happened so fast that it came in. And a lot of people perhaps didn't expect us to be granted Division One status. I think that funk is now over, uh, especially from a player standpoint. Um, how we will judge whether or not it is successful or whether or not it's a failure, we can't do that now. It'll take maybe three, four, five, ten years down the road before we know. Obviously, the pressure is on the men and women's basketball team, obviously. Um, and I believe you cannot judge, especially the first season playing under Division I um, level of play, the, the schedule and so forth. Obviously it's different. You're playing so many games on the, on the road. You're playing tough competition teams that have been playing Division I for years. So that, it's very hard to say that in the first year. Do I think it's good? Why not? Why not? You know, why not give all these players now the opportunity to play at a Division I level? Get some marquee matchups. The IPFW uh, men's basketball team got to play Michigan State at Michigan State. I mean, that's the highlight. When I used to play volleyball, one of the highlights was going out to California and playing UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, and so forth. So to judge it in such a short term, especially after a year, really difficult, if not impossible. Uh, we'll see maybe next year or three or five years down the road in the midterm range. Uh, but I think now that people are over the funk and people are starting to get behind it. We've seen the crowds for the basketball team at the Coliseum. We've seen the IPFW men's volleyball crowd. People, I mean, I'm the biggest soccer fan. I go out to all the soccer. The showcase was fantastic back in September uh, last year. So people are starting to rally now behind the teams at the Division I level. No more excuses can be made. And I, I think that's where we stand particularly right now. But is it a failure? Is it a success? I don't think we'll know that for a few, few more years. If you could only be candid. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what got me here in the first place, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks very Where'd much go? for coming in. Thanks um, for having me, Mike. I, sorry you're not going to be here Saturday, but uh, there is a medical situation you get to have taken care of. And um, we hope to see you alongside on the 26th when we have a basketball uh, volleyball double, double header. That should be pretty interesting. Bring so, an extra set of change of clothes because we're going to be doing that. <laughs> Bring an extra set of change of clothes. We'll do it. Thanks, it was nice to be here. Thank you much. Ryan Peratt's been my first guest, my partner in crime on broadcasting sports here at College 56. We'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk with Bruce Patterson from the women's basketball team and uh, discuss a little more in detail how his team is progressing. But that's coming up next when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, it kills over 1,500 people every year and injures 71,000 more. Inadequate sleep has been linked to health and safety risks, even premature death. But today, new treatments are helping millions get the sleep they need. So talk to your doctor or take our free risk assessment on the web at sleepfoundation.org. Sleep deprivation. It's real, it's dangerous, and it's more treatable than ever. Hi, I'm Amanda Tapping. 
On Stargate SG-1, my character discovered that the Stargate could be used as a key to unlock an endless variety of adventures. Your key for endless adventure is a good education. Don't limit your options. Stay in school. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. Uh, we shift gears a little bit. We did talk a little bit of uh, women's basketball briefly with Ryan Perrott. We're going to extend that conversation now as we welcome back not only to the program but uh, to Fort Wayne, the head women's basketball coach here at the University, Bruce Patterson. Welcome back because it's been a long time since we spoke with you and you've been to a lot of places. Uh, thank you for the welcome and, and uh, yeah, we have been a lot of places and uh, it's been a long road trip. But at least we're home, at least for the moment. <laughs> Uh, this is, uh, my, my wife actually asked who I was uh, since I was walking in the house every night. She knew that couldn't be me. And, and, uh, but no, it, it really is nice being back in, in the fort and, and having a chance to sleep in our own beds and, and to kind of get back in the normal swing of things. It's been a trying stretch in more ways than one. Let's <clears throat> go back a little bit. The last time we were on, uh, we had the upcoming trip over the holidays. And we'll talk first with the trip to eastern Kentucky and then we'll talk about the trip to the Bahamas. But um, way back when, on the uh, 29th and 30th of December, uh, you went down to Eastern Kentucky to play in a little tournament. And uh, first up was the host school, mm -hmm. Eastern Kentucky. Talk about that game in the end. Actually, the actually, that being the, the first trip out, I mean, the, the first uh, of this, this sequence, uh, I thought we played great. Uh, we, we were actually matched against teams that were just bigger and stronger and a little faster than we were. Uh, I think we lost to Eastern Kentucky in the end by somewhere around uh, 8, 17, 18 points, somewhere in there. Uh, but quite frankly, it was a competitive basketball game. We, uh, we, we were able to hang in there and play hard with them. And, and uh, when it was done, um, their coach and, and uh, their players were very, uh, uh, very satisfied that they were in a good basketball game and very complimentary of the way, the way our kids play. And then the next night, uh you had a chance to take on Moorhead State, who you had played earlier in the year. And uh, unfortunately, it was the same result. Uh, but then uh, Moorhead State's got a pretty good team this year. Well, Moorhead State was, uh, I don't know what they are right now, but they were 10-1, and 1, I believe, when we played them. Uh, uh, they're, they're very large. Uh, they're, I think they start 6'4", 6'2", something like that in the middle. And, and they're not just big players. They're quality athletes that know how to score. And frankly, uh, we had them for a while. I mean, uh, I think with 10 minutes left to go, I think the spread was uh, two or four points. Uh, our kids had played really well. We had, we had broken their press, which they, the last time around, they just ate us up with the press. And, and uh, we had broken their press on a consistent basis. And frankly, uh, Mike, I, I think the difference between that ball game and, and um, you know, winning and losing that ball game was that we just ran out of legs. Uh, uh, we didn't have enough enough bodies to be able to spread the the wear and tear of trying to beat that press and to try to press them ourselves. Uh, and we just uh, ran out of legs. When you run out of legs, you run out of heart. When you run out of heart, you get beat. And so we, um, we it went downhill, and and we lost in the last few minutes. Um, you know, in a in a ball game that I was very proud of what the kids did. I thought they played hard and played well. I think. Uh for the benefit of some of our viewers that may not realize what's happened, you're shorthanded in a number of ways. We lost a couple of players due to academics. We lost Lindsey Warrens due to another concussion. Um, obviously, it's added pressure on the remaining players, not just to do well, but to stay healthy, uh, to be able to compete for the 40 minutes. How's the team able to, to deal with that? Well, I think it's a real struggle. I mean, you just mentioned two players that for the first um, five, six, seven ball games this year started for us. Uh, Kathy was offering, offering up, I think she offered up uh, three or four double-doubles, uh, double rebound, double points uh, against Moorhead State the last time she played. Uh, she had double-double. Uh, so, we, you know, it, it was a huge loss, and Lindsay obviously is one of those 24-year-old point guards that you don't get a chance to have, a, have play for you very often, and, and she's a very smart, heady, heady player that, that uh, for her safety, the school has made a decision that after she had the, the uh, fifth concussion or sixth concussion, whichever way you want to count it, that it was, that it was appropriate for her not to play anymore. And, and I concur with that, although it hurt both her and us as a squad. 
Um, how the team's holding up on it, uh, w you know, we came back after that. Uh, f frankly, the first game out of the box after losing Kathy Hay uh, was Western Michigan, which is a, uh, a MAC school that had done very well in the MAC, had a player in the middle who had gotten a tryout uh, in Colorado Springs to the junior Olympic team. And um, we just, for 35 minutes, we took them apart. Uh, I think at one point we were up by 27 points. Uh, they put on a run at the end and, and uh, got it back down to where it was close, but we did a heck of a, a heck of a job and, and uh, played them hard and played them well. So we, you know, we were very happy with that. But uh, I will tell you that the lack of that depth, I mean, that's two more people out of the rotation. And now instead of being in a, a nine and eight and nine and ten person rotation, you're now down to a five or six or seven person rotation, and, and it has paid it, it has taken its, its toll. Uh, and now we're so susceptible of to injury. If we take an injury any place, like we took in the Bahamas when we lost Laura Douglas, um, lost her eight minutes into the first game, and um, at the time we were down by five or six, and we lose that ball game by almost 30 because we just didn't have any answers to come back. Uh, played a team in the second game that, quite frankly, we led at halftime, led led uh, late in the first half by as many as 12 or 14 points, but again, the lack of legs and the lack of inside ability to rebound the basketball, which Laura really takes away from us, just just cost us uh, big time. So we're struggling. Uh, we're, we're struggling to stay afloat. The kids are working hard. They're trying to, to make up for it in, uh, in many different ways, and, and some of them are, you know, they're trying to get that job done, and we're doing it pretty well. Um, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be a struggle to maintain that for the next ten games. Well, let's, let's go back briefly and we talk about uh, the trip to the Bahamas. Which uh -huh. you hear something going to the Bahamas in, the, in December, January sounds <laughs> great. It was a short trip, um, but you did play the two games, and you say you did lose Laura early on in game one. Um, was against Bucknell, and the next night uh, you had to take on Lipscomb, which is a team that. Believe it or not, you got scheduled for two more games of which you've already played one. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. Um, as far as those two games are concerned, um, can you expound a little bit further on how they played? Yeah, I, I thought uh, we came out at the beginning of the Bucknell game, and, and Bucknell's a heck of a basketball team. They, uh, they actually won that tournament out there because they beat Cal Berkeley uh, in the championship round. I think it was Cal Berkeley, but anyway, uh, they, they won the tournament. Um, and they just got out and got in our face and, and uh, you know, they just took us out of our rhythm and, and early on they jumped out on us I think by 12 or 14 points very early. And then we kind of worked our way back into it. I mean, we got our head straight and, and we hung right there uh, at somewhere around the 10 point uh, spread until about the seven, eight minute mark uh, to go in the first half. Uh, Lord goes baseline. Uh, goes up for a shot, um, uh, bumps into one of their players, uh, goes down, and, and uh, we think we thought at the time broke a wrist. Uh, it was a serious injury in that it, it puffed up almost instantly, and so we knew we were probably without her for the for the balance. Um, that again, we tried to battle through that, but now you're bringing in another player deep, and you know, frankly, we don't have a lot of inside play. Uh, left on the squad anymore since we lost the two kids to academic problems. And, um, you know, they hung in there for a while, but it, eventually Bucknell was just too tough and they ran it out to a 30-point win. And, 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 you know, they played well and did their job. We just didn't have enough horses to, to match up. Uh, we come back the next day against a Lipscomb team that, I, as I already said, uh, we, we felt like we matched up pretty well against, and, and we were doing well against them, but Laura was not available. Uh, actually, we thought she was going to be available for some spot play because we didn't really know if it was broken the next day. Uh, she went onto the court, was out there for about two minutes, reached up, touched the ball, and we knew it was over then. Um, so we took her out of the ball game, and that's all she played was about a minute and a half. Um, you know, I, the, the kids played pretty well. I mean, they, they did the thing to do. But when you lose a mainstay, a kid that started every ball game from the beginning of the thing, and we've already lost two starters from the beginning of the year, it just, um, it just got away from us. Uh, they started taking it inside. T ended up with her fourth foul. Uh, Tia Dudley ended up with her fourth foul about four minutes into the second half. 
Um, I have to tell you, I wasn't that excited about the referee when we had out there. <laughs> um, but that being said, you know, T got her fourth foul about four minutes into the second half, and and um, and now we were playing without her also, and and that then we got real thin, and so. Yeah, they, they took it out and they beat us somewhere around 15, 17 points. I don't know exactly what it was. Well, that ended the trip, and you came back to the, I won't say the snowy Midwest, but the colder Midwest. And um, then last week, um, you went up to South Bend, took on IU South Bend, which is a pretty good Division II team. Um, I still think they're still Division II. They're, they're NAIA Division I. They're NAIA, okay, okay, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I thought they were, but in any event, Still a good program, mm -hmm. and um, the, the the shots started dropping. Well, let me clarify something first, by the way, for all those who are begrudging us our trip to the Bahamas. It was 65 and windy. It was not a nice <laughs> time, by the way. I'm just making that clear. We didn't do any bathing out on the uh, sunbathing out by the pool or anything like that. The kids tried a couple times, but it just wasn't uh, it wasn't great weather. We we just unfortunately had rain and that kind of thing. Anyway, going to IUSB. Um, I, I, you know, I, all we did there was just calling the kids. You know, we were without Laura. We knew we'd be without Laura, so our, our, uh, our um, substitution rotation was diminished again. So we're down to, I think, actually seven players. That's not true. We had eight because we had just picked up Chrissy Miller to go along with us, a volleyball player who had not played basketball in something like six years. Uh, so Chrissy joined us, and, and we went up there, and we just called on the kids' ego. Uh, we said, you know, whatever you've been through, you're, you're still the NCAA Division I team here, and they're an NAI squad, which I'm very familiar with because we've played them, you know, I've mm -hmm. played them, and, and that's what I've coached for the last 10, 11 years. Uh, you need to just step up, and I think uh, the kids stepped up, and, and uh, we didn't do a great job defending the post, but that's because we were short inside, so they scored a lot of points from the post. But we were trading them threes for twos all day, and the kids just shot well, and they, and they ran hard, and they, they turned them over a lot. And, and um, you know, it was an easy victory, and it was something, quite frankly, we needed. It was a big win, 112 to 75. And uh, so the morale got a little bit better. The gals were happier. And then last weekend you got back on the bus and you went down to Nashville and you took on Lipscomb again. Uh, yeah, actually we didn't get on the bus, we flew down, uh -huh. um, um, but then you, you know, I, I almost believe that's harder on the kids because they've, you know, have to get to the airport now two hours ahead of time and then you got the flight to Chicago and then Chicago down there and then we get on vans and we drive down. It was a, it was a long, arduous trip. It wouldn't be so bad necessarily all by itself but you stack it to the fact that we just came back from the Bahamas and the Bahamas was almost two days, less than two days travel after the uh, Eastern Kentucky trip. Uh, uh, frankly, the kids, um, you know, I feel for them, they're worn out. Uh, it, I can blame it on somebody else because I didn't make this schedule, <laughs> but, but it is a hard schedule for the kids and they, they are just flat worn out. So we gave them Monday off coming back and we did go down to Lipscomb, a beautiful school, going back to play somebody that we'd already played. And frankly, they had learned from the first time. They knew what they could do against us and what they couldn't do against us. And it was, it was an ugly game, uh, an ugly game, and then neither team was able to shoot the ball. I mean, we were, I thought, for the first 10 minutes, getting all the looks we wanted to get. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we shot 20% in the first half. We were four for 27 from the threes. Um, we are awful dependent on the threes. That's, that's not necessarily my, the, what I want. Well, it's not what I want long term. I like to have a good balance and be able to get the ball inside and out. We just don't have that available to us right now because of our lack of depth inside. And, um, you know, when you go cold, uh, you know, there were times I, I mean, I think from the foul line we were 7 for 18. So you, you know the legs are gone. The, the, they were really just reaching down and trying to pull on whatever reserves they had. Uh, but, but all that being said, uh, I, you know, I just, the kids have done a good job hanging in there and, and uh, we'll be back on top of here, here soon. We're going to get another Western Kentucky game, or Western Michigan game, or, or uh, uh, somebody's going to get surprised and uh, maybe it's a Saturday against Toledo. Well, we're going to take a break and when we come back, 
we're going to talk about what's coming up for this ball club and uh, we're going to talk about some adjustments that everyone's having to make on the team, players and coaches alike. But uh, we'll talk about that and more when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. everything. And now you can give something back. By becoming an Earth Team volunteer, you can help the Natural Resources Conservation Service care for the good Earth. Right in your own community. It's the only Earth we'll ever have. Help make it a better place for all of us. Call 1-888-LANDCARE to find out how. This is me and my mom and dad, and my big brother, Alex, and Jack. This is the day I learned that sandals got their name from sand, and that the ocean is bigger than all of us. This is the day we all got to forget I was sick. This was my wish. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. Our topic this half of the hour is women's basketball. Our guest is the head women's basketball coach here at IPFW, Bruce Patterson. And Bruce, uh, it's a tough trip that we just talked about, the travel. Um, it turns out three trips to Kentucky and back, to the Bahamas and back. And as you just mentioned, going on to Tennessee, which I thought was a bus trip, and I thank you for correcting me, but uh, getting on an airplane and back. Now we're home, at least... Uh, for a little bit, mm -hmm. and we've got uh, a very uh, interesting weekend coming up here at the university on Saturday. A big men's and women's basketball doubleheader at 1 o'clock. The men are going to play you in West Chicago from the Horizon League, and at approximately 3.30, I believe, uh, your team is going to take on the Toledo Rockets from the Mid-American Conference, a team that's an awfully good team in spite of their 7-7 seven and seven record as we tape this show. Um, a little more pressure because not only is it a home game, but we're going to have some conference visitors, a couple of different conferences, at least one that I know of, that's going to be here. How nice is it going to be to be playing this next game at home? Well, I, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look back at our history and uh, our short history uh, this year and, and recognize that we play a lot better at home. I mean, we, uh, we've only had one game at home where we where we struggled, and that was uh, the Eastern Illinois game where I didn't think we played very well. Uh, other than that, even in the losses, we uh, we stood toe to toe with some very good basketball teams, and I you know I think that Toledo has to be aware of that, and I'm sure they are aware of that. This is a team that's well coached, and and they they you know they beat Duke early this year. Uh, we've already got figured out if Duke wins the national championships, we're national champs. Cause <laughs> We beat Western Michigan that beat uh, Toledo that, that beat Duke, but I don't think it works that way, but if it, if it does, we'll claim it. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a team that's well coached, and they understand what they have to do, and, and they're going to come in here well prepared uh, to try to play against us. But it's awfully nice to be back in, in uh, the Gates Center. Uh, we think there's going to be a huge crowd there uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, there's, it's been a huge effort to try to make, make sure that we have a big crowd for the men and women's game. Uh, so I think it's going to be a thrill. If it's anything like what happened last Friday night when we had uh, Long Beach State in here and the fourth largest volleyball crowd in the history of the university, over 2,200 fans, uh, I'm not sure you know, if it's and uh, it'll be a great, uh, great event. Let's talk a little bit, uh, as I mentioned to you off camera, for clarification purposes, a uh, little X's and O's, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We started out the year, I believe, with the prox. I think it was 10 players, maybe 11, I'm not sure. No, actually, there were 11 that were available. Yeah. Available. Mm -hmm. As coaches, you get into what's called a rotation system. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how the system works in general, what you wanted to do at the start of the year, and now because there are fewer bodies, what changes have to be made? 
Well, each coach has their own system that they that they live and die with, and, and our coaching staff has been very successful with playing as many as 11 players. The perfect rotation, obviously, is 10. You know, you, you have a, a point guard and a backup point guard. You have a two guard and a backup two, and, and so each kid can stay in their sequence, and, and you work them on and off the court. Typically, one group will get a little bit more playing time than the other, but certainly you always get fresh legs. And, and we used to always consider ourselves, when we were on the other side of town, to have so much more talent depth-wise than other teams that, that by the time it got to the last 10 minutes of a second half, the other team was folding tent and going home, and we were, we were uh, just starting to, to get fresh. And so that's where we started off the beginning of the year. We, we started looking at the number of kids we had and the quality of the kids that we had, the talent level of the kids we had, and thought, you know, if we can get to nine kids in a rotation, which we felt pretty comfortable with, uh, that could go on the court and, and be able to compete against the D1 level at this point, and then you can try to wear teams out and you can, you can press and you can run and you can do a lot of things differently. Our situation is right now um, that we don't have that depth. I mean, if you, first of all, we're small um, because when we lost the two big kids, the 6'3 kid and the six footer, uh, we end up with a center that's, that's as, I'm as proud of as any kid that I've coached in a long time. Uh, Tierra Dugley is just fun to be around. She works her tail off, but she's 5'9 to 5'10, playing against kids that typically are 6'3 and 6'4. It's just that simple, and, and there are times when it's, it becomes a mismatch. Uh, so our rotation has changed a lot just because of that lack of depth. And now, uh, for example, when uh, we take um, uh, Courtney out of the game at the point guard, uh, we rotate over our, our two guard, who really likes to play the two better than she does, but now she's got to come over and play the one, and it, and it takes away some of her legs and, and other things because there's a whole different level of, of um, activity that's going on there. Uh, so so that uh, has affected our rotation that way. Uh, the Amy Geralds who, of this world, who uh, are your, obviously your mainstay offensively, uh, you really don't have a replacement for her. You got to keep her on the court, you know, 35, 37, 38 minutes a game, and and try to give her real short breathers, especially when the Laura Douglases go down. When Laura went down, I mean, our rotation was all screwed up. I mean, we had players playing out of position, kids that, you know, just uh, are asked to do things that that their body and uh, isn't necessarily their body and their habits aren't necessarily equipped to do. Um, I don't know if I answered your question there, Mike, but, but basically the rotation has changed substantially because of that lack of depth. Uh, we have had some kids step up. I, th I think Kat Seawright, uh, who quite frankly early in the year wasn't in the rotation, uh, has come out and, and done a, an admirable job to us, or for us. Uh, I think Ashley Powell, who, who wasn't in the rotation early. Uh, has come out and in some games uh, been able to help us a lot. Now, frankly, when we went down to Lipscomb this last time, she wasn't able to help us. She was, uh, she was struggling with the flu also and only played about four or five minutes. And I, I have a great deal of admiration just for the fact that she went down there and tried to give it the old college try. Um, but, you know, those kind of things um, uh, certainly do affect what you're trying to do on the court. With the loss of the big people, the, the, as you said, the structure of the attack changes, and, and uh, whether we like it or not, we're going to have to live and die by the outside shot. Mm -hmm. And you've got some very good shooters, Amy Gerald, mm -hmm. Hillary Kulik, uh, Courtney Nicely. Ashley uh, Powell. And, yeah, you've got some mm -hmm. good shooters. But now, because the emphasis has to be on it for them to produce, how do you try to alleviate what's obviously added pressure? And do you and the staff, do you devise different types of plays to try to get them open, uh, obviously you like to have the big sized gals that can set the screens and so forth, but since you don't have the big gals to set those screens, how do you devise ways to get your, your shooters open to hit the shot? Well, um, I'll just correct one little bit there. Actually, I, I think uh, we actually have gone to more screens by our big people or our, the people who are denoted as our, our big people, although they aren't very big. Um, we. I think our biggest problem that we have is that teams that scout us 
know that we have an issue of not being able to have a go-to person who we can take the ball to inside, find an opportunity and score. So you become one-dimensional. Now, when your defenses are, are looking at that, um, the defenses are out playing uh, up in your face all the time to take away your outside shot, making you put the ball down on the court and then using their big people to uh, pick up once you beat them. So if you get by that wave, you're always running into another big body in there because they aren't as concerned about you dumping the ball inside and being able to take them on one at a, uh, one-on-one. So now you're, all that really has to happen is you have to become better screeners and you have to have much more motion on the outside. Uh, if, if your outside players become stagnant, um, it, when you're in motion offense or, you know, we run a few more sets now than we used to just to make them, make them move, but if, if your outside people become stagnant and they become, start to stand around, then they become real easy to guard and now all you're doing is firing up threes from the outside and, you, and it'll show up like it did at Lipscomb with a 4 for 27. Now I'll tell you there, I thought we had enough good looks from the threes that I really put more of the blame on um, just a travel schedule and a fatigue level than I did on, on necessarily something Lipscomb did to us early. Now later on I thought they, you know, it's like the shark seeing the blood in the water. I mean once they saw that we were struggling, they really came out and started to get after us and then I thought they played a lot better defense. But, um, you know, we, we just, uh, we have said to ourselves and we've said to the kids, look, we're going to try to get some inside stuff. We're not going to give up on that. But frankly, we are you know, we are, um, we count on the outside shooting. If, if we shoot well, like we did against Western Michigan, um, you better be careful. Or if you get against a team like IUSB that didn't guard us very well on the outside, they better be careful. And so if a, if a MAC school comes in here, whether it's Toledo or we go back to Western Michigan, if they try to guard us in the same way on the perimeter, uh, you never know what could happen. Well, we wish you well, and uh, we look forward to bringing this contest this Saturday to our viewers here in College 56 Sports. And uh, hopefully we'll come out of this with a W and a big upset and uh, show the world that we can play Division I basketball. But we wish you well this Saturday. Okay, thanks. Bruce Patterson has been our guest, the head women's basketball coach here at IPFW. We thank Bruce, as we thank Ryan Perrott for appearing earlier on the program as well. And as always, we thank you, the viewer, for tuning in to Macedon Spotlight each week to see what's going on with IPFW Athletics. We invite you to come back next week for another edition of the program, and we invite you to tune in Saturday for a big doubleheader. If you can't make it in person, out to the Gates Sports Center, tune in to College 56 Sports at 1 o'clock. The men's basketball team plays Illinois Chicago, and at approximately 3.30, the women's team plays host for the University of Toledo. So come on out if you can. If not, tune in. And uh, tune in again next week when we come back with another edition of Mastodon Spotlight. But until then, this is Mike Miles saying have a great week and go dance. Last Saturday afternoon, over 1,800 fans filed into the Hilliard Gate Sports Center to watch Division I basketball, both men's and women's. To see how things turned out, stay tuned to Mastodon Spotlight. It's coming up next. Dr. Matthew Kubik is an architectural engineering professor at IPFW who utilizes his experience to teach his students one-on-one. -on -one. So it's really shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder learning that we're, we're looking at problems together for the first time. Dr. Kubik also is the director of the Honors Program at IPFW. 
His ability to teach on a personal level allows him to educate to the needs of his honors students. They want more conversation. They want a closer contact with professors. They want uh, interactive learning in the classroom. He is thankful for the advantages of a combined classroom of young students and students who are returning to college after years in the workplace. That mix of students creates a classroom environment that is, that is exciting, that's, that's vibrant. IPFW, the right school, right here, right now. everybody I'm Mike Moss welcome to another edition of Mastodon Spotlight well, as I said a moment ago last Saturday big day here on campus at IPFW over 1800 fans came into the Hillary Gate Sports Center to watch Division One basketball both men's and women's first half of our show this week we're we are pleased to have with us the head men's basketball coach here at IPFW Doug Noll and Doug your team took on Illinois Chicago from the Horizon League in the first game that we uh, had at the Gates Center Saturday. We're going to talk a little more in depth about that game, but the first question I want to ask, A, how nice was it to be at home, and B, even though the result wasn't what we wanted, how, how nice was it to see 1,800 fans in the stands? Well, it was great on both, both counts, Mike. Uh, we were really pleased to be back home now for five of six game stretch and uh, you know, feel like uh, that we've got somewhat of a, uh, a home court uh, uh, schedule right now and the other thing was uh, the fans were just tremendous uh, I tell you what all the uh, all the people in the athletic department led by Mark Pope our athletic director and Ron Clark and of course all the coaches uh, that uh, really pitched in to help uh, get people out just did a tremendous job and and I can't thank them enough I know uh, uh, you know it was a, an electric atmosphere and, and obviously the games were disappointing uh, on both my end and I know Bruce's end from the, from the women's side, uh, but they really played a great, great team in Toledo that upended number six Duke. And we played uh, Illinois Chicago, who took Purdue right to the wire at Mackey Arena. Uh, they also uh, almost beat Southern Illinois, who's 16 and three right now, and, and South Florida, who is very good. So we, we both played uh, uh, some quality teams. Uh, the outcomes weren't really what we wanted, but uh, I think in all it was a very successful day as far as, uh, uh, you know, a day of Division I basketball at the Gates Center goes. Well, let's dissect a little bit your game with Illinois Chicago. Um, and in a few moments, uh, John is going to have some highlights, first half highlights. First and foremost, uh, they come in, a member of the Horizon League. They've got a head coach who worked with Lou Henson at Illinois for a number of years and Jimmy Collins. And now he finally gets a chance. It's his sixth year at Illinois Chicago. Um, talk a little bit about the fact, the stability that a school has, having a coach who's familiar with the, the area. I mean, Chicago right there. And, and as you and I mentioned off camera, you were in Chicago recently uh, doing some uh, scouting, recruiting, hopefully, and so forth. Talk about the type of high school ball that's played in Chicago first, and then uh, we'll get into the highlights and talk about this first half of action. Well, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, Chicago is one of the hotbeds for high school basketball uh, with all the leagues they have. And, and Jimmy Collins, uh, you know, played at New Mexico State for Lou Henson, and, and then when uh, Lou was the Illinois coach for a good number of years, and I don't even know what it was, maybe 20 or 15, um, he was his uh, head recruiter and, of course, you know, spent all that time in Chicago. So he's been very familiar with it. <coughs> Excuse me. And obviously getting the job there was uh, like going, you know, right to his backyard. And, and so he's had some time to cultivate the program uh, to get Chicago kids. And they're tough kids, let me tell you. And uh, they play tough. They play hard-nosed basketball. And they're going to do a lot of great things, I think, in that, in that league. Um, you know, and they were... Um, uh, they had a, a difficult week last week with a couple teams, and so I think they came in here really looking to turn things around, and boy, they did. Uh, shot 70% the first half, 
60% for the game, and we didn't have an answer for anything they did. I was uh, really pretty uh, disappointed with with our effort, but um, you know they. I got to give them credit. They just uh, they came in and they took it uh, from us, and um, uh, we we played. We played okay the first half. I mean, we hung in with them. It was 10 points, uh, but the second half just got away from us, and and uh, you know that was that was disappointing, um, you know, for our coaching staff, for Joe and Fred, and and you know for putting the time in because it really doesn't matter if we're playing Tri-State or Michigan State. You know, we're going to do the same amount of of scouting, same amount of watching tape, same amount of a scouting report. We're not going to we're not going to do anything less because of a, a less opponent or a better opponent. We just try to stay on the same course of uh, you know, bringing information to our guys. And of course, we can't go out there and shoot, pass, or dribble, or rebound, or do anything like that. It's up to them. And for the most part all year, our, our, our kids have really handled things well. Uh, and I don't know if it was the, the big crowd or, or uh, just what. Maybe we'll never know. But um, uh, I was just disappointed in the effort. Well, let's take a look at some of the highlights. Uh, we're going to ask John Yaus, our Chief Cook and Bottle Washington, the man that makes this show go to, to start the highlights. It's early first half action, and uh, Illinois Chicago is in the red. <clears throat> we are in the white. Well, one of the things that we noticed, Doug, in a hurry was uh, their backcourt was quick. And I know Dave Scouten and I talked about how well, not only did they shoot the basketball, but how well they passed the basketball. Oh, no doubt. <clears throat> but two things, uh, you know, uh, two things that really helped them is, number one, our guards were really in a gambling mode, and I have no idea why. Instead of just playing chest to chest and keeping them in front of you, our guards seemed like they wanted to try to pick them or gamble or whatever, and then we would get beat, and then we were slow to rotate, and they would make one extra pass and find Cardos or, or uh, you know, one of their uh, banks, one of their uh, uh, perimeter players on the outside, and they just knock a three down, and and uh, and basically it would be wide open. We didn't communicate very well. And anytime you don't communicate, your defense is going to be, um, it's going to be less than effective. I mean, communication defensively is, uh, is the key to anything. And uh, here, of course, D'Angelo, uh, uh, you know, t took a nice drive to the basket. They've got us right now 10 to 7. Uh, we're putting on a little bit of pressure right now, which we wanted to try to do. Here they get over the top and uh, miss a shot, which is what we want them to do. We want them to speed it up a little bit. We probably could have could have pressed them a little bit more uh, during the game, but really they got they got up on us so quick that we just kind of had to play from behind most of the time. Were you expecting them to be as athletic as they turned out to be? Well, we knew they were going to be pretty good. I didn't think they were going to be as deep as they were because of uh, the stats we had watching them on tape, and one of their better players got hurt the first game of the year against Indiana State. Uh, here we're running a little set play. It's called a punch over the top. We got Nick a good look, and, of course, he struggled. Saturday shooting one for eight, and I think uh, it was either a week ago or two weeks ago uh, he led the NCAA in threes uh, for that week. So uh, we just didn't get what we needed to from him. And anytime we don't, you know, we're going to struggle a little bit. But um, here they missed the the shot, and Jeremy takes it inside and works his way in and gets a nice little three four foot jump shot. And if he can back people down, especially a guard, he's long at six six and. And, uh, you know, we can really get him inside to score, too, as well as outside. Is the three the best position for Jeremy, playing a three? Yeah, because normally your best shooter's at two, uh, and your, your most athletic person or, or a, a person that slashes uh, goes to the basket, uh, does a lot of putting the ball on the floor and attacking the cup, uh, is your three. Your four is more your power forward, and, of course, your five is your post. So the three is definitely that. And, we can put him at two a little bit maybe and, and have, have, have played him at four. Uh, there Nick just uh, puts it on the floor, one or two dribbles and pulls up. And obviously, you know, Nick's not going to jump over people, but uh, he's very quick, very deceiving when he puts it on the floor and, and uh, knocked it in here. Here, here we didn't rotate very well, uh, but we did get a steal. And uh, here I thought D'Angelo really got fouled. I was really... Uh, uh, upset about the the no call here. Uh, Dave on, and I commented on it as well on the air. I mean, it, it's got to be one thing or another. It's either a foul on him, um, you know, because there was there was contact obviously, uh, or it was a block. And the guy was not set. I mean, we watched the the tape there, you know, five six times, and there was no position by their player. And and D was knocked to the floor, taking it to the basket. So you got to protect the shooters. And and at that point in time, 
one of the refs have to step up and call that? Well, we went on and we had a timeout. It was the first media timeout. At this point, we were down one, 12-11, uh, and then we come out of the break, and Jeremy hits a three-pointer. We go up 14-12 with 15-37 uh, left. They tie it, and then a little bit, a few seconds later, Brad hits a three. We're up 17-14, and then the next four and a half minutes, we went in the tank. I can't say it any, any differently. Uh, they outscored us 13-0. Uh, as I commented to you, looking at some of the numbers and the notes and that, we only had three shots in four and a half minutes, missed them all. We fouled three times, threw the ball away twice, and in this, that four and a half minute stretch, we go from being up 17-14 to being down 27-17. Uh, and that basically, for all practical purposes, was the ball game. Yeah, Mike, we... Um this year, I mean, I, I, I think for the most part we've really battled hard, and um, I think a lot of people, um, regardless of the record, think that we've done a, a really an admirable job with the teams that we have played and the schedule that we've played, and 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 we do for the most part. We know we got to get better, we got to get tougher, we got to get stronger, and it's a process, and and we want to take that one day at a time. Uh, but that's been our Achilles' heel has been big runs by other teams, and. You know, you, you've kind of got to look to leadership for that. And, and again, that's some things where um, we've got to step up our leadership too. You know, when, when we're shooting the ball well and things are going well, we can take quicker shots. But when, we're, when, when other teams are making their run against us, that's when we've got to, uh, we've really got to play smart. We've got to, we've got to say, okay, we can't take quick shots. We've got to move the ball around. Let's stretch the defense. Let's break it down. Let's try to get to the foul line or get an open look, get the ball in the Knicks' hands, uh, get it into the post, something to stop that momentum. And um, I think we tried to call a timeout or two, but uh, they just made a run in that four minutes. And, and um, you know, if you, if you look back when the season's all done, we've probably played the majority of the games pretty, pretty strong, pretty tough. But we'll always look back and say, Here's three minutes. Here's four minutes where we just kind of let it get away, and and you know you can't do that against good teams. Well, at that point they took the lead and they increased it to ten at halftime. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about the second half, and then we'll talk about the team in general. And we've got a big game uh, this coming Monday night at the Coliseum, and we'll talk about that as well. But that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. I'm David Copperfield, and throughout my career, I've done lots of the magic. And I made a few things disappear. But there's one thing I can't make disappear. Teenage skin problems. If I could do that, I'd be able to restore a teenager's self-esteem. But then I wouldn't be a magician. I'd be a dermatologist.
Welcome back to Macedon Spotlight. Our guest is the head men's basketball coach, Doug Knoll. We've been talking about the first half of action in our game that was played this past Saturday afternoon at the Gates Sports Center against Illinois Chicago. And Doug, we just talked about the run that Illinois Chicago made. They took advantage of some mistakes <coughs> on our part and some good play on their part. They went in the locker room up 53-43. Could have been more, but Terry Collins hit a shot in the last couple of seconds, a nice three-point shot, which I thought might give the team a boost going into the second half. It didn't turn out that way because Illinois Chicago came out of the gate on fire and uh, expanded the lead, and everything seemed to go downhill in the second half. Yeah, it's um, kind of strange how you look back and you think, well, what if I would have done this? What what uh, adjustments could we make? And we tried to make the adjustments based on the first half, but if you remember, we, it, it was kind of, um, I think the, the first half and how bad we played was overshadowed in the fact that we hit nine threes. And uh, I mean, you know, you're on your way to 18 threes, which you're not always going to get what you shoot the first half, but when you look at it, if you, can, you, know, you get nine the first half, you're thinking, you know, boy, I'm, you know, we're shooting the ball really well, and we're still down 10 points. So I think it that kind of uh, really had a, a false sense of really how bad we were playing is because we knocked some shots down. And the second half came out, I think they, they, or the second half, when it started, I think they ran, ran off an 11-2 to run. And uh, that really put us down about 19, 20 points. And we were digging out from, from that point on, and I think the closest we got was probably in the last minute or two then, 15 or 17 down. So uh, it was just really... Uh, uh, really pretty discouraged at that point in, in our intensity level. Of course, we didn't shoot the ball as, as good. They didn't either, but you're not going to shoot 70% the whole game, but they shot about 50, which allowed them to shoot somewhere close to 60% for the game. They shot 10 of 20 from three, uh, and we only made 10, so really we only made one more in the second half. And, um, you know, we seemed to get a little more fatigued, and, and um, uh, we just got down, and it seemed like, um, really, I don't think the kids deliberately gave up, but it really looked like that. And, and um, again, from a coach's perspective, you know, you, you never want to, you know, feel like your kids gave up or quit. Uh, you know, subconsciously, I don't think we tried to, but I think we looked at it and it just felt like too big of a mountain to climb. And, and, um, but a couple kids did, did pick it up, and I thought Terry played really uh, – uh, as well as he's played all year, uh, offensively, defensively, uh, he needs to work a little more on things. But again, he's just so young. I mean, he's a freshman. He's only played six, seven, eight games. Um, he's had some good games on the West Coast. A couple times he should have given the ball up uh, when he didn't, and that's all a learning process. But he was used to scoring big numbers at Snyder, and and uh, you know he's going to help us uh, the next three, four years. And you know we're excited about that. But when I look down the list. You know, I didn't, I didn't think too many of our guys really had what we called uh, average games or, or good games, but I thought Terry played well offensively. All right, we'll take one final look at some of the numbers of this game, and then we're going to throw this game in a garbage can, and we'll look ahead. Um, Illinois Chicago, as we said, they were 21 of 30 from the floor in the first half for 70%, 8 of 12 from three-point range. I know they hit five of their first seven three-point attempts. Um, they out-rebounded us 20 to 11 in the first half. And uh, we look at the final numbers, as you said, they shot 51% in the second half for 60% from the floor from the game, 50% from three-point range. Their so-called Achilles heel, as Doc and I talked about, at the foul line, they were only 11 of 18 for 61%. We, on the other hand, shot 42% from the floor in the first half, 35% in the second half for 39% overall, 48% um, in the first half from three-point range, only one of ten in the second half when the issue got out of hand. I can even figure that one out, Mike. Yeah, yeah then that, that's better than me. 34% for the game from three-point range. We did hit 20 out of 25 free throws in the second half, which is good. It's what you've been wanting all year, 80%. For the game, 79% on uh, 26 of 33. Well, we got outboarded 47 to 22. We got um, out-assisted 12 to 11. They blocked two shots. We didn't block any. We did outsteal them, so to speak, seven to four. But the bottom line, Illinois Chicago 99, IPFW 80. If I can dare ask, what do you say to the team in the locker room afterwards? 
Uh, you probably shouldn't ask, but uh, <laughs> it basically was um, very, very short. In fact, I wrote two things up on the board. Uh, practice at 6 a.m. Monday morning and practice at 1.30 p.m. Monday afternoon. And um, we've always discussed with them that, you know, if the coaches feel like the effort level wasn't what was expected of them, that we would come back after the game and practice because sooner or later we need to make that effort level. Uh, we need to we need to make a, a consistent uh, effort each and every time out, and and that's basically all we ask, Mike. I mean, we know it's very difficult this year, and will be next year, and probably the following year. Uh, you know, until we can start to uh, you know get our system working, and then you know next year we have the 13 full rides. This year we're at the Division II level which we never were before, but now we're up to about 10 scholarships now, which is what Southern Indiana and all those teams in the GLVC have. Next year we're up to 13 full rides, which now is what you know Duke and Purdue and all those have. We don't expect to be at that level, but now we expect to be able to recruit kids that you know can play and compete at this level, and that's what we need to do. So <clears throat> we feel like if we're not going to make the effort level during the game, then we'll come back and make it during practice and that way they'll want to make it during the game. The girls played after us and I did promise them Sunday off because we have nine days off between uh, UIC and Oakland and so um, you know the coaches we didn't take Sunday off but uh, we let the players have off so we just used that as Monday morning and we told the guys to be in here at 5.30 a.m. I particularly didn't want to be in at 5.30 a.m. but uh, uh, you know that's the part that uh, they have to take responsibility for their actions, and their actions said they didn't do what we needed them to do, so we came in. And, and of course, through all this, we want it to be a learning process, and, and that may sound harsh at times, but, um, you know, we always feel that they're better than what they think they are at times, too, and we've competed with teams, and it feels good. It really feels good to go compete against a team that's a lot better than us, and you can be, and you can be satisfied. I mean, I've been more displeased in, in a certain number of wins we've had this year than a couple of the losses, because I know Michigan State, it would be almost impossible to beat them, a San Diego State, a Colorado State, an Oregon State, and we've played very well against those teams. Wright State, who beat Butler, our game was four or six points down, down the wire uh, before we had to foul them, and I think they beat us by maybe 12 or 14. But, um, boy, when we compete, we're not bad. You know, we're not a great team, but when we compete, you know, it's fun and we're not bad, and when we don't, boy, we can, we can be real ugly and we can be bad. And so that's the thing we're trying to get through to these guys. That don't matter, it doesn't matter who you're playing, but it does matter what kind of effort you make each and every time out. Up next on the schedule, this coming Monday night, a return trip to Memorial Coliseum where we had the season opener against Moorhead State. This time we get to play Oakland University out of Rochester, Michigan, a member of the Midcon. Um, they're going to come in here. Uh, as we're taping this show, they are 10-9 and nine overall. They are 7-0 uh, and oh at home. They are 3-2 and two in the Midcon. So they're right in it because Valpo is on top at 4-1. and one. And um, looking at some of the numbers, uh, some of the players, they've got four players that are averaging double figures. They've got a six-footer who's averaging 19 points a game, and then they've got three guys who are averaging between 10 and 12 points a game. Ironically, for the year, they're scoring 72 points a game, and they're allowing 72 points a game. We're scoring 73 points a game, but we're giving up 84 points a game. I know there's hopes that it'll be another big crowd at the Coliseum. What's the order of the week for this basketball team, and what do you expect to happen come Monday night? Well, we're, uh, you know, we're excited about going back to the Coliseum, although <clears throat> we enjoy the gates, and uh, we've had a nice run here. Um, the one thing about the Coliseum, it's very hard for us to get adjusted to it because we can never practice there. And uh, it's much the same way as the Fury, uh, those teams. You know, they don't practice there. They just play games there. And so... It's kind of a, I'm not sure we're the home team anyways, we'll be wearing our white, but we probably don't, do not have much of an advantage as, as to home court, although hopefully it'll be a nice crowd and we we'll, uh, can use the crowd. And I think we're going to come back and respond. I've got, I've got a lot of confidence in these kids. I mean, and that's what they are. They're kids, you know, 18, 20 years old, 21, and they make mistakes and, and they do things that, um, you know, that they have to learn through and, 
And, uh, you know, we got a, a real good group of kids, and I think they're going to respond and come back and really play well. Oakland, on the other hand, you know, they made the move four or five years ago, Division uh, One from Division Two. And the one thing that they were that we weren't is they were very successful in Division Two. Part of it is, you know, their funding and everything. They had the full limits on everything. So they were very they were a very good basketball team in the uh, in the GLIAC. And uh, Greg Campy and I have done battle before, and uh, he's a very good coach. We're kind of doing him a favor, and he kind of owes us because, you know, they are eligible for the tournament this year. All the other teams in the Midcon have played twice now at the Coliseum, uh, or should say not twice. Some of them have played five or six games, but they've played two years now there, and this is the third year of uh, the tournament being at the Coliseum. They have yet to play in the Coliseum. So I'm doing them a big favor by letting them play. You were reading play. my mind. <laughs> uh, and, and, and Campy knows that, and uh, he owes me. So, uh, uh, you know, we're going to make sure that he remembers that. But uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be ready. Um, like I said, we practiced twice yesterday. I was on the road in the afternoon. Uh, we're practicing as we speak right now. And, and um, I've got to leave for Kansas for uh, a couple days and then back to Michigan. And it's a good week for me to to uh, get out on the road and recruit right now because uh, we've got some time off. We'll take Thursday off. But, you know, with, with uh, Joe Pachota and Fred Andrews, I've got two great assistants. And I let them do a lot because if I need to be gone, the guys need to, need to just, you know, come in and, and uh, make it another day. Make it that, uh, well, hey, coach is here. We can, you know, coach isn't here. We can, you know, we can take it easier or whatever. They know that they're going to have to play at the highest level if I'm here, if I'm not here. And that's why these guys have done such a great job. And, and uh, our kids know it too, and I think they'll respond to them. But uh, not having a game and, and being independent, this happens. I mean, this was the Ball State week that we had to move the game to December 6th, I think. Uh, but then, um, you know, we, we play them Monday, and then we go Monday, Thursday, Saturday, Monday, four games in like eight or nine days. And then we, we don't play till the weekend, so we've got another gap in there. But uh, this allows us to get out on the road some. Well, we wish you well. Uh, hopefully you'll get your voice back. Yeah. You have not what I had earlier. It's basically back uh, more than it has been the last couple of days. Well, we wish you well. And then uh, we'll talk with hopefully you or Joe next week. Uh, we'll see highlights of this game on Monday night. And we'll look ahead to two more home games, as you mentioned, too, next week. But uh, get your voice back. Good luck. Safe travel. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Mike. Doug Noll has been our guest, the head men's basketball coach here at IPFW. We'll take a break, and when we come back, a conversation we had with Bruce Patterson that took place right after the women took on Toledo last Saturday at, Cal at the uh, Gate Sports Center. But that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. Dr. Larry Life has an unmatched desire for teaching and theater, and for 30 years he has rewarded his students at IPFW with his expertise and friendship. We know all of the students. We know them by name. We're on a first name basis with them. Uh, we follow their progress very carefully. As chair of the theater department, Dr. Life knows the unparalleled advantages IPFW offers compared to larger universities. In a larger program, very often a student, if they're an actor, doesn't get on stage until they're, so most times their senior year. Our students are on stage or designing uh, their first, second year here. Through three decades, Dr. Life has stayed focused on why he loves to teach. Watching a student grow. Watching a student start at one place and two years later see them in another place. IPFW, the right school, right here, right now. Today's teenagers, the way people talk, you'd think they can't do anything right. It's just not so. We get to know over 300,000 kids a year, smart kids, who know what they want. They believe in themselves, and they believe in America. Some go straight to college. Others choose to learn leadership, discipline, courage, and commitment first with us. Today's military, making a stronger America, one good kid at a time. This is me, and my mom and dad and my big brother, Alex, and Jack. This is the day I learned that sandals got their name from sand, and that the ocean is bigger than all of us. 
This is the day we all got to forget I was sick. This was my wish. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. We come to you now from the conference room at the Hilliard Gates Sports Center. And uh, I'm uh, especially pleased to be visiting with head women's basketball coach Bruce Patterson. And I say especially pleased, coach, because uh, as we're taping this, it's literally moments after your team got throttled by the University of Toledo 90 to 57. Um, I know it's awful early, but uh, let's, we're going to talk about this game first. Uh, a, a very good Toledo ball club, and they shot the ball well, they rebounded well, and they kicked their tail. <laughs> well, they were 15-1 uh, and one in the MAC last year, and they uh, won the MAC tournament, and they went to the NCAA tournament, and they only graduated uh, one player, one starter off the team. So. Uh, we knew they were good, and we knew they were big, and, and uh, we had to do certain things to stop it, and quite frankly, we didn't do it very well. Believe it or not, we actually got off to a somewhat decent start. We scored the first bucket of the game. We were in the ball game at one point, uh, as we were looking at the sheet, um, seven and a half minutes in, we're only down two. With 544 left in the first half, we're only down uh, three at 32 to 29. But they went on a little bit of a run, and all of a sudden it's halftime. It's 49-29. I don't know what happened in that last five and a half minutes, but they went from a three-point lead to a 20-point lead. Well, I think they decided to dig it inside even more, and, and uh, that hurt us. Uh, I think our legs got a little tired. You notice they got a little couple quick downs on us uh, where they got over the top of us and got back down to court on us, and, and that hurt us. Uh, but most of all, um, we stopped scoring. I mean, you know, frankly, with our size, we have to score with people uh, as opposed to just going in and shutting them down because when people go in and you've got 6-2 going against 5-10, um, it's really a mismatch, and, and um, we stopped scoring, and why we stopped scoring, they didn't. Let's talk a little bit about that size factor. They came out with uh, a couple of their gals, um, uh, Heron, number 42, is 6'2 or 6'3, and, and uh, Teresa Colley is 6' or 6'1, and in the second half they brought in our 6'3 freshman who went nuts on us. And as you said, our tallest player now, due to any number of reasons, is 5'10, stretching it to maybe 5'11. They worked it for perfection, their offense. They got the ball down low. Um, as a coach, obviously it's frustrating, but how do you try to counteract? When their size advantage. Uh, well, what our game plan was, we were going to try to be doubling the post, and and um, we um, we tried to do that. Uh, I, I didn't think we rotated to it very well. Uh, that's a little different than what we taught defense at uh, in in prior spots because we've never been caught in this kind of a size mismatch before. Uh, so we've kind of changed it. We're just trying to get the kids uh, learning how to do it. Um, uh, but the fact is, um, you know, you either <laughs> you either get there or they score, and quite frankly, we didn't get there quick enough, and they scored. Toledo has a nice balance of not only size, but their backcourt was quick. Mm -hmm. um, and as you alluded to, some easy baskets that they got in that big run, which got them out to that 20-point halftime lead. Have you seen a team like that where it's, they, it's a very nicely balanced team? Size up front, quickness in the backcourt. Yeah, Ball State's that way. Um, you know, Ball State did the same thing to us. I think Ball State game, uh, they beat us by a, a larger margin, but uh, in, that's, in that scenario, I, I honestly believe that the injury we took to Courtney during that, or to Lindsay during that game really um, kind of set the tone and set us back a little bit. Uh, but, you know, the, it, there's a number of them out there like that. I, you know, I don't, I don't say that we've played a lot of them, but certainly Ball State and, and uh, this squad were just, uh, they're a handful. I mean, we have to become better. we got to get better and better players in here and more and more depth to be able to compete at that level on an ongoing basis. Well, I'm trying to figure out, and I think back, this Toledo team that beat us today lost to Western Michigan. And we beat Western, and we get another shot at Western in February. Uh, uh, well, I... I get another shot at him isn't the way I would phrase it. I'm a little <laughs> nervous about that. I think they'll be hunting bear when they're down there. But I, it is a matchup problem. Actually, Coach and I were just talking about it. Their coach and I was just talking about that. Uh, Western came in and played soft on our guards and, and uh, kind of packed it in a little bit. Even off their man-to-man, -man, they packed it in. You can't walk away from Amy and Hillary and, and those kids. They'll, they'll knock down threes on you all day. And, and you know, frankly, uh, Mike, we have to score from the threes because we just don't have 
the scoring machine that we can go in, post up, receive the ball. You saw it today. I mean, I don't know how many blocks we had when we tried to take the ball down inside. But, you know, we got a score from outside, and then their guards, they came out and got in our face. So they take that piece away from you. We don't have another option. And that's what you, on a basketball court, that's what you got to have. If somebody takes something away from you, you've got to be able to go do something else. And, and frankly, we just don't have the personnel to be able to do that yet. But the operative word is yet. Yeah. Time, hopefully time will come and come soon. You go into the locker room, you're down 49-29. What did you say to the team? I don't think you want that on tape. <laughs> <laughs> now, a actually, that's not true. I'm not a, I'm not a cusser, so it, it, it wasn't any bad words going on. But I, I was frustrated with them. Uh, I was frustrated with the 22-6 to rebounding edge. I, I thought that was an embarrassment to them. I thought they should have been uh, mad as heck at themselves for that happening. And I challenged them to come out and uh, to uh, start banging bodies with the other squad. I, I really thought Toledo the whole time through made sure they were checking us pretty good and, and uh, bumping us whether we, was, whether we were timeouts or whether we were in an active part of the game. And, and because they were checking each other back and forth, I, you know, I, I really challenged us to get in there and get physical. I think beside the size physical height differences that you saw in the squads. One of the other things I think you saw there was a physical broadness of the shoulders and a, and a size of the biceps. And you know, one of the things we have to do between now and next year is our kids got to get physically stronger. I mean, you take Courtney nicely, who I love to pieces. I mean, Courtney's one of my favorite kids and, and going to be one of my favorite players here before it's all done. Uh, but Courtney is a string bean, and they're, they're going out there and checking her, and they're they're moving her off the ball, and and right now she's allowing temper to get involved, and when her temper gets involved, she isn't the player that she can be, and that's why she set some in the second half because she allowed that to happen to her. Uh, so you know, there's uh, we just got to get physically, you know, I I said we we got to get bigger, stronger, faster. I think that one player who did heed your advice at halftime and played extremely well in the second half. Was Amy Meyer? Uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we've challenged Amy. Uh, the issue with Amy is really different. I mean, she has a size problem in that she isn't as physically as strong as she needs to be. But Amy is a very good scorer. She has the ability to score with the basketball. However, she has a tendency to stand around, to stand in the corner and wait for somebody to get her the ball so she can shoot it. And we've said to her, you've got to get on your horse and get moving so you're not so easy to guard. And we've been talking to her a lot about that in the last two or three games. And I thought she did that, you know. And, and when you can move, then you've got to make the defense move to you. And, and she did better at that. And, and uh, of course, when she gets her opening, she doesn't need a very big opening. She can get her shot off. And when she's hot, uh, she can put some points up on you. Now she ended up with uh, a team high 17 points. Mm -hmm. Um, Amy Gerald's had 12, Tiara Dudley had 10, um, but when you look at some of these numbers, team-wise, 21 of 58 from the floor, and uh, that's only, what, 36%, uh, long distance. And it's kind of sad, and, and Dave Scout and I were talking about that during the broadcast, yes, this team has to live on the three-point, especially due to the size limitations. But when you get behind, there's added pressure. I got to knock down a three, and and it's, it's a shame because, as you said, there are a lot of pure shooters on this team. Hillary Kulik, and Amy Meyer, and Amy Geralds especially come to mind. Ashley Powell, if she can get spotted up, and it, it's just a shame that there's that added pressure on them to knock that shot down. Well, and, and that's what I was saying earlier. I mean, when you only have one option. Um, I shouldn't say only one option, when that's your primary option and everybody in the world knows it. I mean, I, one of the things about playing all these uh, quality coaches that you're playing against every day, I mean, they've probably saw three, four films of us and, and they've made determinations that uh, here's their strength, here's their weakness, go out and take that, we that strength away from them and they don't have the ability to go to the other side. And you're right, it, there's a lot of pressure on these kids to hit shots. Um, you know, we talk about it every day in practice. We talk about it not from a pressure standpoint, but of a point that that's, I mean, that's our salvation. If we can get hot, we can beat you. If we don't get hot, we can't beat you. Well, bottom line in this one was Toledo 90, IPFW 57. Uh, Rockets, that was their fifth one in a row. They're 9-7. and seven. We're now 4-14. Four and 14, And now tomorrow being, tomorrow being Sunday, you have a practice, and you get on a bus and an airplane on Monday, 
and you go to Missouri for a game on Tuesday against Southeast Missouri State. Actually, you got it ahead of, a day ahead of time. We're off tomorrow. Uh, we'll practice Monday, and then on on Tuesday we get on the bus to go down for the game on Wednesday. Uh, but that's the schedule we got, uh, Mike. Is is so unfair to these kids. It's not even funny. Not only are we undersized and, and understaffed, but the schedule is just as mean as it can be. I mean, we. Uh, we fly into, or we drive down to Indianapolis to fly over to St. Louis to drive down to Southeast Missouri, which is in Cape Girardeau, about two hours below St. Louis. And then after the game, which will be about 9, 9.30, we have to drive back up to St. Louis because we got a flight at 7 o'clock in the morning, which means we have to be at the airport about 5, which means they're going to have to get up at 4 to, to try to get over there. And, and it's, um, I wouldn't do this to my worst enemy. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, that's just the way it fell out. I, I'm not making excuses, but these kids are getting worn out, and and uh, we just don't have enough depth. That being said, we'll show up at the game on Saturday, Wednesday night, and we're going to battle to the end. And when we come back here on next Saturday, we're going to battle to the end. Speaking of next Saturday, again, you come back home, and it's nice that you don't have you play Wednesday, but you actually do. Granted, Thursday it's going to be recovery day in a manner of speaking, the trip home. And then Friday you'll go through and get ready for next Saturday when the University of Detroit Mercy out of the Horizon League comes to town. What can you tell us about UDM? Well, we know they've won some big games and we know they've struggled some too. They've been a team that's really been up and down. Uh, as uh, They're not the level of competition of a Toledo, but they got some good athletes. I mean, they can run and jump. Uh, um, but really, Mike, we've been spending less and less time on the opponent and more and more time on us. Uh, you saw tonight a press that we used that, that uh, frankly was different than any press we've used. And we just installed it this, this week. It's a press we've used for the last five, six years. We didn't get, want to give them too much, and we've decided that we're going to give these kids all we can give them. They're going to absorb what they can. We decided we're going to press for 40 minutes and, and uh, see what happens. And, and you know, we're enjoying it. I, you know, even when we're losing like this, I enjoy these kids. They're, uh, and, and I honestly believe we'll be better for it next year and the year after. One final question, and we'll let you go. There was a nice crowd here this afternoon. Yeah. Um, thoughts on playing in a bunch of a lot of people, in front of a lot of people, I should say. Well, frankly, that's what ought to be here every time. Um, and, you know, but I, I understand we've got to go out and we've got to win these uh, these teams or these people's hearts over. I mean, we've got to go out there and give them something. And, and that's, you know, we, we've talked about a lot with the girls that when we get a crowd in here like this, um, we got to work our tails off all 40 minutes. I mean, I, I hope whatever happened today that nobody in those stands could look down and say, oh, IPFW quit. You know, I just don't want them to say they quit. I mean, we, they can say they beat us. They can say they're taller than us. They can say they say anything they want. And all those are accurate, but they will never see us quit. And and I thought our kids played to the last 40 minutes. And and you know I thought there were periods of time we had our chin down. We you know get them in the huddle and say no, not yet. You know the clock hadn't gone off yet. You can go home and cry about it tonight. But right now we can't. We got to play. We appreciate you coming in, especially after a tough loss. Uh, we'll let you get out of here, and hopefully enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, we wish you a safe trip to Missouri, and uh, hopefully a W. And then we look forward to broadcasting next Saturday when you're back here against the University of Detroit. Okay. Bruce Patterson has been our guest, the head women's basketball coach here at IPFW. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk with another special guest who uh, was also on the scene here at the Gates Center this afternoon. So uh, please stay tuned. Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. Excuse me. Could you tell me where the Blackstone building is? Ding-a-dong. Hee-haw. Excuse me, could you tell me where the Blackstone building is? Rack attack, smoke stars of people. When others can't understand you, and you can't understand others. The Blackstone building? I'm not to like a mishmash. Then you have a clue what it's like to live with a communication disorder. Millions of Americans are born with these conditions. For millions more, problems develop later in life. Speech, language pathologists, and audiologists are developing new treatments and new technologies that bring people together. You don't happen to know where the Blackstone building is, do you? Shenandoah. For more on communication disorders and where to find help, call 1-800-638-TALK. Shenandoah Street, two blocks down. Thank you. Thank you very much.
a public service message for the American Speech Language Hearing Association. They came from every corner of the country. From small towns and big cities. But they all shared one thing in common. They belonged to a family called Marines. A tough and determined few dedicated to protecting everything we hold sacred. And still, they come. Celebrate the 225-year history of those proud few who have earned the title Marine. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. If you were in attendance at the Hillary Gate Sports Center last Saturday, not only did you see an exciting men's and women's college basketball, at least if you were a fan of Illinois Chicago or Toledo, as unfortunately they beat the Mastodons, but uh, during timeouts between games and in breaks and so forth, you saw a lot of things going on the floor. And uh, we had the uh, opportunity to talk to the uh, people that are mostly responsible for that. To my immediate right is Brian Miller, and to Brian's right is Justin Bush. And they are, uh, Justin is the president of student government, Brian is a vice president. And uh, Brian, you have been called IPFW's number one fan. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to Mastodon Spotlight. Well, thanks, thanks for having Mike. us, Mike. You do a lot of things, Brian, uh, on the floor, off the floor. Uh, I guess first and foremost, for the benefit of some of our viewers that don't know about you, tell us a little bit about yourself, then I'll ask Justin the same thing, and then we're going to talk about how student government and athletics mesh here at IPFW. Okay. Well, I've been very involved in IPFW since day one of joining the university. Uh, from Fort Wayne, went to Carroll High School where Justin and I both went, and uh, we've kind of buddied up and taken IPFW by storm uh, since 1998. Uh, got involved in student government this year as uh, the president of the Student Activities Board and vice president to Justin. And uh, doing that, been able to have a lot of fun, and that's uh, the, the thing that I've learned from uh, the people at the Fort Wayne Wizards is that you need to have a, a fun family atmosphere, and that uh, comes through entertainment, whether it's uh, the basketball team, me, or some of the events that we do. Uh, student government has given us uh, money and allocated a lot of things that can be done this year that weren't done last year and given us a, a viewer-friendly environment. How did student government get involved with athletics in the first place? Well, to be honest with you, I think it comes uh, for two reasons. One is uh, the ties that I've had in the past, doing the announcing and you know, being the voice of the Dons. And two just comes from the hard work of, uh, of Justin and I, as well with uh, Ron Clark and uh, Mark Pope uh, in particular. Uh, I think Mark's really um, you know, done wonders in that athletic department. And uh, the combination of, of us and uh, the director of student life, Lori Beth Royce, uh, it's been a great marriage, if you want to call it that. The basketball season for men opened up back in November at the Coliseum, and not only did we play our first ever Division I home game against Moorhead State, but student government created the first homecoming involving basketball. How did that come about, and uh, looking back at it now, do you feel it was a success? Personally, I think it was very successful, and uh, the start of something that's very exciting here at IPFW, and that was, uh, you know, the start of student government and athletics working hand in hand. Mark, Jennifer Bosk, Lori, Beth, and myself worked uh, very hard, and a lot of a lot of planning went into the event. And I think you'll agree, as the viewers, it was very successful. We had a lot of fun. We did a lot of fun things. We got people involved. We got everyone involved, and really, uh, really gave ourselves a good image. Justin, as president of student government, how important is it? to have the students become even more involved with IPFW athletic events? 
Well, I think it's very important. Uh, Brian and I wanted to create a more of a fun environment in student government when we took over. Um, a lot of the events were only attended by, you know, maybe 10, 11 students. Um, that's a major problem. With, uh, with, I think, Brian is creating a lot of excitement through SAB's connection with athletics. It's a good way to touch the students. Uh, I think there was 1,800 and change at our last men's and women's basketball game, which is, you know, getting 1,800 students in one area. And Brian out there, you know, with a plethora of prizes, throwing them out to, uh, to the students and actually letting them get involved. It's a great way to actually touch the most amount of students. And athletic events, uh, you know, create an environment, too, where people actually want to come out and enjoy different things I tell you when there's not in between their classes. So I think that the excitement with athletics and also the amount of people there, it's a great way that SIB's tapped into that. And uh, I know Brian's worked really hard this year, and even in the newspaper it was commented uh, the person that was head of the MidCon even said he enjoyed the events that were in between. So I think student government is definitely making an impact on campus, and Brian SIB is doing a good job of being the forefront of that. I have to ask you, Brian, where did you come up with some of these ideas for some mm. of the timeouts and halftime and some of the things that actually go on and, and maybe describe some of them for some of the viewers that haven't either been in attendance or been able to watch it on TV. Right. Well, Mike, I've just been a, a huge fan of sports my, my whole life. Uh, you know, when I go home, I watch a ball game. And uh, the past two summers, I've been involved with the Wizards, and I don't think anybody does it better than those guys over there. Great guys to work for and uh, just great marketing people. And a lot, a lot of the ideas come through them. The, we had sumo wrestling, you know, and then, you know, the different variations of playing one-on-one -on -one or actually going out and wrestling or, you know, playing uh, knockout uh, with the sumo costumes. You know, that differ differentiates a little bit. And those are, you know, some harebrained ideas that, you know, myself or uh, Mark come up with. Uh, and then some of the other ideas, we do the hula hoops to get the kids involved and going out and getting prizes. They just try and incorporate everybody. Is it's really a, a community effort when you look at the prizes and, and wanting to get involved because the community wants to reach out to IPFW. We just need to reach out to them and get them involved. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention not only did you have the homecoming with the men's basketball opener and last Saturday, as we said, over 1,800 here for the doubleheader, but a week prior to that, the men's volleyball team got their season off and they played a nationally ranked team in Long Beach State, and you also did some things there, and there were over 2,200 fans there that night in the Gates Center. Um, what's ahead? Obviously, we've got a doubleheader coming up this Monday night, again at the Coliseum. What's in uh, store for us there? Well, uh, we have a wacky game show, kind of like uh, Double Dare, and it's called Blizzard of Bucks. will be where contestants will have a chance to win up to $500 in cash doing wacky stunts and uh, we'll be having that during halftime of the women's game in between the men's and women's game and then at halftime of the men's game and then after the games are played we're gonna have the championship round contest where somebody can get in a, a cash cube and try and accumulate f up to five hundred dollars worth of cash that's just one of the many things as well as you know the sumos and the the hot shots and the hula hoops and you know the freebie toss stuff that we'll be doing as well and uh, you know, Mike, one thing I'd like to say about this year, it's very rewarding going out and, you know, and having the opportunity to go out and do that stuff in front of the, you know, the 2,000 fans. It's just been, been wonderful and uh, something that I take a lot of pride in. I think a lot of praise has to go uh, to Brian, too. I know I've been involved in student government for quite some time, and, and it's all about bringing the programming to the people, which I think that he's in student and SAB's done a great job this year. Like you said, 2,200 people they got to enjoy. I mean, he actually puts their dollars to use to actually bring some fun to campus. What's in the future? Uh, outside of this coming weekend at the Coliseum, there's still uh, a few opportunities left for basketball, and I know there are several volleyball matches uh, left. Are you going to continue to do things throughout the rest of the volleyball season? And, and what about the spring sports? Where, and uh, might you have anything in mind there? Absolutely. Uh, we need to keep this ball rolling, and it, it's all about momentum, and it's contagious. And now that we got it rolling and we got people involved and people having fun, we need to keep this ball rolling and not just be something that on these big days we do. It needs to be a, a constant. And for baseball, there's tons of things that we can do, you know, whether it's a barbecue. One of the things that we do is we, ha we have the, the free food for the students or, you know, just, just a leisure fun day that will bring people out to the ballpark or, you know, to a men's volleyball game. There's tons of promotions and stuff like that that can be done and uh, we're going to continue to do them and plug away. and. Still bring uh, programming on campus as well. We have a dance coming up for, for Valentine's Day, and we have a kids' carnival coming up. And there's just all kinds of program programming that we're going to continue to do. 
as well as uh, bring a huge concert to campus, which March 23rd. And that'll be some more coming out about that. We uh, are bringing a big concert out to the Coliseum. And I tell you what, Mike, I'll give you the, the privilege of uh, being released. We're bringing Tone Loke, Digital Underground, and Sir Mix a Lot to IPFW, March First 23rd. First time ever released right here on Mastodon Spotlight. First time it's been out. <laughs> so that's huge. Uh, huge for the show. And uh, we're going to have 7,000 tickets, and I have no, no doubt that we'll fill that Coliseum. Final question, because we're just about out of time. Is there a number that not only the student body can get a hold of you guys at, or the community as well? As, as I say, you're trying to put the community and the university together. If either of those groups have questions, thoughts, ideas, or want to volunteer time, effort, and ideas, how can they get in touch with the two of you? Absolutely, that'd be great. And the best way is uh, in our student government offices. My number is 481-6590, and uh, that's in WALB 225. I'm 481-6588, and we welcome anyone to stop by. Um, usually up there just hanging out most of the day in between our classes um, and putting things together. So stop by or call. Gentlemen, thanks for giving us a few minutes of your time. We wanted to uh, let our viewers know that student government is involved with IPFW Athletics this year. We commend you on your uh, efforts and uh, wish you continued success. Thanks, Mike. Thanks we'll for having us on. Take, take a lot of pride in being involved with the athletics and you guys. Thanks again. Brian Miller and Justin Bush have been our guests involved with student government here at IPFW. Uh, we also want to thank Doug Knoll and Bruce Patterson for appearing this week on the program as well. That's it for this edition of Mastodon Spotlight. Again, a reminder, Saturday, Doubleheader action again here at the Hilliard Gate Sports Center. At 1 o'clock, the women's basketball team plays host to the University of Detroit Mercy from the Horizon League. And at 7 o'clock uh, Saturday night, uh, the IPFW volleyball team will be taking on the University of Finley in uh, MEVA volleyball action. If you can't make it out here in person to the Gate Sports Center, please be sure to tune in to College 56 Sports. Ryan Parrott and I uh, will be here to bring you the action for both events. And uh, again, we invite you to come back next week as well when we once again talk IPFW Athletics on Mastodon Spotlight. But until then, this is Mike Moss saying have a great week and go Dons.